never be afraid. There's nothing which is known which can't be understood. And there's nothing which is understood which can't be explained. For over 50 episodes now, my team and I have brought you to the very frontier of knowledge in physics and astronomy. And still, our mission goes on. To present you with your birthright, an understanding of the universe. I've traveled the world seeking out a certain type of genius. Masters of not only their academic disciplines, but also at explaining their research in understandable ways. And I've bestowed upon these women and men the title of Titanium Physicist. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, L.A. Physique! People often think that when something is gone, you'll never have the chance to know its nature. Like a book. Go into a library, take a book off the shelf, throw it in the fire. There, you're warm. And no one will ever be able to know what the book says ever again. But it's not quite true. Even when it's gone, what it leaves behind tells a story. Even if what it leaves behind is nothing at all. I mean, in the book example, you could probably guess at the book's size by looking at the hole it leaves behind on the shelf. You can guess its topic by looking at the topic of the books around it. Let's see. Um, Good job. You destroyed the World Book Encyclopedia letter H from 1993. It's generally true that you can tell a lot about something by the hole it leaves behind. The empty dog bed surrounded by little chewed up pieces of fluff. The seat at the end of the bar farthest from the television that no one is allowed to sit in. The missing tooth that your tongue can't help but poke at. Or the hole in the pumpkin pie that's shaped exactly like my fork. I mean, think of footprints. What are they but the absence of mud in a very specific way which tells you about the shape of the foot that displaced it, and also the shape and weight of the animal that stood there? So it is that in physics, we often use the conspicuous absence of a thing to deduce things about the object or material that caused the absence. How do we, for instance, know what kind of atoms compose the sun? If you take the light emitted by the sun and pass it through a prism and then study the breakdown of the colors, you'll see dark bands in that spectrum. These are absorption lines. Every type of atom will absorb a characteristic collection at very specific frequencies. And the argument goes that the sun should emit a continuous spectrum of light, light at every visible frequency. And thus, the atoms in the sun's atmosphere are backlit by this light. And as they absorb their specific frequencies, they're going to leave shadows behind at those colors. The Fraunhofer absorption lines from the sun are exactly these shadows. And you think about it, wouldn't it be great if everything in the universe were backlit? Then, even if you had some material that was dark or cold or weird gas that doesn't emit light, we could still see their shadows. Well, it is, and we can. Rashid Sunyav and Yakov Zeldovich first predicted that we'd be able to in the later half of the 20th century. The source of this backlighting is the cosmic microwave background, a type of light emitted before any galaxies or stars were formed, back at the start of the universe, and a type of light that's been traveling for longer and thus from farther away from us than anything we can see. Today on the Titanium Physicist Podcast, we're talking about the sunyav zeldovich effect. Speaking of things from back in the beginning, today's guest is returning to the show for a second helping of physics. He wrote and sang the song from the start of every episode of our podcast. He's the front man for his band, Ted Leo the Pharmacist, and he's also in a hit band called The Both with Amy Mann. Welcome back to the show, Ted Leo. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> okay, Ted. I've assembled two of my old friends to greet you. Arise, Michael Zemkoff. <laughs> 
Dr. Mike did his undergraduate degree at UBC with me. He did his PhD at Cardiff University in Wales, and he's currently an assistant professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology, working on experimental cosmology. Now arise, Danica Marsden. Whoosh. Dr. Danica is an astronomer who did her undergraduate degree with me at UBC and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Afterwards, she was a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara, where she did research on MKID detectors. She's currently a project manager working at D-Wave Systems. All right, everybody, let's talk about shadows. Let's start talking about the cosmic microwave background. The argument is that this effect is what happens when shadows are formed in the cosmic microwave background. And to understand why and how that works, you need to know about this light that's getting filtered out. So, Ted Leo, we've, we've talked about the cosmic microwave background before. Do you remember anything about it? I do, yeah. That's one of those things that um, I think it's out there in the ether for anybody to have a, a sort of, you know, tourist, you know, basic grasp on. Is it not? Right. So the cosmic microwave background is our best evidence that a universe started with a Big Bang. Okay. And essentially, it's light that was emitted from a time when the universe was really, really hot and really, really dense. And so talking about the story of that light kind of illustrates why this sunyev zeldovich effect is so useful. Primarily, the idea is that because of the nature of the cosmic microwave background light, we can see cosmic microwave background radiation in every direction we look. And that's why this is helpful. It's literally backlighting all of the structures in our observable universe. So, quick refresher. The easiest way to explain cosmic microwave background is to talk about uh, the universe's uh, dynamics on, on a large scale. And the easiest way to do that is to talk about what would happen if the universe evolved backwards. Um, so what if somebody had taken a video of the universe from the very beginning up till now and then started playing that in reverse? What would you see? Um, so what you'd see is, okay, so there's galaxies everywhere, structure, clusters of galaxies, galaxies flying all over the place, black holes, stars. Um, what you would see if you played the thing in reverse is the stars would turn back into clouds of gas, very exciting, and then the clumps of gas that make up the galaxies would kind of spread out. At the large scale, uh, observationally, we know that currently the galaxies in the universe are getting farther and farther apart. So if you played that backwards, you'd see the galaxies over reverse time would get closer and closer together, right? So if these clouds of dust that make up all the galaxies now, uh, they get closer and closer together until they merge into one big dusty, gassy soup. And in this backwards video, you would say, what's causing all these galaxies and all these bits of elements to get closer together? It's got to be gravity. Your model for the universe would say that all of the dust and gas is kind of collapsing down onto itself, not to a point, but you would say that the density of matter is getting higher and higher and higher. It's not collapsing down to a point because the universe is infinite in every direction. So instead what you see is, as the distance between every atom gets smaller and smaller, the rate of collisions increases, the gas will heat up, and eventually you'll just get this really, really hot soup of gas. So that was the backwards picture, and the argument is that gravity is causing this evolution. Einstein's theory of gravity predicts essentially the same type of dynamics will happen the way it has in our universe, where it starts out as an infinitely wide, tall, long density of gas that gets rarefied, that spreads out, that gets cooler as the universe expands. And so the important thing to note here is that when gas gets really, really dense and really, really hot, it does what has happened on the sun, which is it gets so hot that the electrons get knocked off of the protons. And so what you end up with is instead of a whole bunch of neutrally charged atoms, you have a whole bunch of positively charged protons bouncing around in a soup with negatively charged electrons. So early in our universe, there was such a soup. There was a plasma, charged particles bouncing everywhere. And the thing about a plasma is that photons can't go anywhere in a plasma because an electromagnetic wave, when it tries to move anywhere will get, immediately get absorbed and scattered off of all of the charged particles around it. So the moral of the story is, as our universe cooled, all of the protons and electrons eventually stuck together in pairs, 
and the gas went from being ionized to neutrally charged. And a neutrally charged gas lets light pass it by just fine. Because when an electromagnetic wave comes by and tries to wiggle it, the electron will go one way and the proton will go the other, and it, the, the thing won't move in response to the electromagnetic wave. So the universe went from being a dense, hot plasma to being neutrally charged, and as soon as it was neutrally charged, all of the atoms stopped interacting with the photons, the electromagnetic waves. And so those electromagnetic waves stuck around. They're still around today. They just uh, never got absorbed. And so they're just kind of still wandering the universe. As the universe got larger, these electromagnetic waves lost energy. Um, so they went from being really, really hot, bright, you know, white-colored mix of photons to a really, really cold mix. But they're still everywhere, okay? So the moral of the story is the universe is full of these, like, ancient dinosaur photons that are really, really cold that are just wandering around in every direction. Does that make sense? Yes. So that signal, those photons as a collection, are called the cosmic microwave background. Uh, cosmic because it's cosmological in origin. Uh, microwave because they're microwaves now. It's a really cool type of photon. And background because they're everywhere you look. Everywhere in space has these photons wandering around from them. But there's an interesting point here. The surface of last scattering, the, the source of the cosmic microwave background, happened when the universe was something like 100,000 years old as opposed to like the 14 plus billion years old it is now. So it was a very, very long time ago. So the neat thing here is that if we look out into the sky, there are photons from the cosmic microwave background that are hitting us, hitting the Earth, hitting our eyes, hitting our instruments from every direction. But those individual photons, the photons that hit us all right now, they have spent their entire lives moving in straight lines. So there's a straight line from where they were emitted, you know, 14 billion years ago, minus 100,000, uh, till now. And they travel at the speed of light because they're light. And so what it means is that there's the cosmic microwave background photons that are hitting the Earth right right now. They all originated on a sphere, on a spherical shell that's like pretty much, give or take, 14 billion light years in radius. So, in other words, there was a shell of photons that were destined to hit the Earth, all 14 billion light years away from us, and they've spent the entire transparent age of the universe wandering from really, really far out to us. Do we know this because of the effect that we're going to discuss in this episode, or is this a theoretical proposition or just a, like an assumption based on the fact that we know they're arriving in a straight line? In other words, if we know they're arriving in a straight line... Why do we know they originated from a sphere? Oh, that's good. Uh, a circle is a mathematical object where all the points on the circle are the same distance away from the middle, right? Same thing with a sphere. A sphere is a mathematical object that's composed of points that are all the same distance from the middle. So in this case, we, I suppose it's, it's maybe an inference that they spent their entire lives traveling in a straight line. Uh, we know this for a variety of reasons. It is consistent with a lot of the other data we're taking. So the argument is, light usually travels in a straight line. This light in particular is consistent with a model where we say, this light is about 14 billion years old, so it must have started 14 billion light years away from us. So you look at all the points in space that are 14 billion light years away, and that's right. a sphere. So if they're hitting our sphere... Mm -hmm. At the same moment, they yeah. they must have originated uh, at a similar shape at a particular point in the past. In other words, they wouldn't be coming from a, a flat... Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Ted, okay. you've um, done this before, haven't you? Uh, <laughs> not much, not much. <laughs> no. Um, just purely as a point of interest. So to put a cap on the on the CMB, the moral of the story is the CMB is everywhere because the universe is expanding in every direction, in the same way. The universe is super, super uniform. Everywhere you go, it's kind of the same at the large scale. Um, but the particular photons that we're seeing when we detect cosmic microwave background photons all originated on a great big spherical shell that's like a little less than, but give or take, 14 billion light years wide. And that particular width, because the structures formed in the time since that, all of the things we can see, stars, galaxies, they all formed since then. 
Uh, the light from distant galaxies is at a smaller distance away than these cosmic microwave background photons. If a particular galaxy formed 4 billion years into the, into the age of the universe, the photons we get from it might be 10 billion years old, but that means that, that they come from 10 billion light years away, and that's still not as far away as the particular CMB photons. And so these cosmic microwave background photons are traveling through and past all of the different structures that have formed since then to reach us. And that's the idea. Everything in the universe is being backlit by these CMB photons. And we can read them because they have a different wavelength or some kind of different structure or... or... Well, they have a very characteristic... Um, oh, shoot, what's the spectrum? Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, so they have a very specific mix of frequencies. That would be different from what we would see coming from something else. Yeah, they're a lot mm-hmm. colder than everything, you know, uh, regular matter and stars okay. and stuff. Right. And then, they have a particular signature, and when that signature passes through a cluster of galaxies, it gets distorted. Right, okay. I'm with you. I get it. Okay, so galaxy clusters, what the heck is that? So we know what a star is. A star is like the sun. And then if you put like a gajillion stars together and have them kind of orbiting around, that's called a galaxy. And then what you can do is you can imagine putting a bunch of galaxies together and they're kind of all orbiting a kind of common center of mass, which in the case of galaxies is basically dark matter, not actually real baryonic matter that makes up, you know, stars and galaxies and you and me, things like that. Hmm. That exerts uh, some sort of force that creates the cluster or that keeps the galaxies in the cluster? Yeah, so dark matter is this weird stuff that is defined by the fact that it interacts solely through gravity on Uh, cosmological scales. So it doesn't do anything except for make other matter want to go there basically. Wow. I did not know that. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So unlike solar system scales, dark matter doesn't matter. Doesn't, doesn't really factor into it, but on galaxy scales, cause the volumes are huge. Sorry. Sorry. Can I, can I, do you mind if I use that line? Dark matter doesn't matter in a song at some point. Go nuts. <laughs> I think you yeah. should. You really <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Sorry. So, okay. So we're dark matter clusters. Okay. So you got the picture. There's, there's a bunch of galaxies and they're all kind of like bees in a hive kind of buzzing around. You know, the buzzing takes millions of years, but whatever, we got time because we're cosmologists. So there aren't just galaxies there. What happens is galaxies are like dynamic systems. And one of the things that happens in a galaxy is supernova. So that's when you have a big star, bigger than the sun by a lot, and it reaches the end of its life and it blows up basically. And so uh, supernova are like messy. They're really messy. There's a lot of energy that gets put into them. And and the thing in the center that eventually becomes a black hole or, or whatever end state it's going to be has some of that mass, but a lot of it gets lost as hot gas, basically. And it's very hot gas because it was, you know, I forget the number, but it's something like the whole brightness of a galaxy happens in a supernova in, in a short time. So so you get these really violent things. And what happens is you make a lot of hot gas and those hot that hot gas kind of blows out of the galaxy. Think like boiling water with a bubble rising through it. And eventually that stuff kind of ends up as this diffuse hot gas just hanging out in the middle of the cluster and between the galaxies... And when we say hot, we mean really hot. So let's see, 10 million degrees Celsius. And and when you're talking 10 million degrees Celsius, it doesn't matter if you mean Fahrenheit because to first order, it's the same number. So that happens. And so you got this really hot gas and it's basically just electrons just kind of banging around out there. So what happens is you get your, I liked Ben's thing of like the old dinosaur photon. It's, it's like, you know, rinky dinking along. It's cold. It's tired. It's been going for a long time. And you got a hot electron and it hits it. And it gains a little bit of, of energy from that electron. Ah, okay. And the electron loses a little bit of energy. So that's called inverse Compton scattering for those who are keeping score. Okay, so run the picture forward. The photon's bumbling along, and then eventually it ends up in, in a telescope somewhere. And we're talking here about photons that have a wavelength like a millimeter, which is roughly the wavelength that your microwave oven works at. So what you're doing is you're you're making a picture of the cosmic microwave background. And I was using this analogy before. Imagine you're looking at a white wall, boring kind of featureless thing. Let's let's call that the cosmic microwave background. It's not really there's a lot of structure, but let's just pretend it's white. Um, 
And what you can imagine is the photons that went through the cluster that I see have a little bit more energy than they should. So what you can imagine seeing is that blue, at least to our eyes, blue means uh, more energy. So what you see is a little blue spot. And then if you get your filters out of your handy filter set, you could imagine um, looking at it in red filter and a green filter and a blue filter. And what you'd see at, at this longer wavelength, of course, but what you'd see is that in red, you've lost some photons. So it's a little bit fainter in that spot. What's happened is those photons have been scattered up. So in the green filter, you probably don't see any difference. It looks like the white wall, but in the blue filter, you see something that's a little bit brighter. And through that, we can actually learn a lot of things about how the universe works. Yeah. So my first question about that is um, what you're telling me is that that change can lead you back to understanding where it passed through that hot cloud of gas. Yes. And eventually create a, create a picture of it, which is sort of the effect that, that, we're, that we're ultimately talking about here, right? Yeah. So if your white wall is your CMB backdrop and you make a picture of it, the frequency of light where you don't notice a change is in what's called the null of the Sonia Zeldovich effect, which occurs at about 220 gigahertz, where the wavelength of this light is close to a millimeter, as Mike had said. But then if you go a little bit over to a slightly different frequency, if you go to, say, 150 gigahertz, uh, all of a sudden all these red dots pop out on your wall. Um, or if you're looking at your CMB map, you see a bunch of what look like holes. And all of a sudden what's popped out of this map is the location of clusters of galaxies. And you have found them in a way that is not limited by how bright they are. It's only limited by how big they are, the, the mass of them, as, okay. as far out as they exist. Now, my only question about that is, so could a photon with a similar signature appear to you that just originated somewhere else and therefore re retained this little bit more energy in, the, in, in this area? And, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you get false positives? Yeah, can right? you get false positives? Yeah. Uh, so what we're talking about is kind of like population statistics. Uh, imagine if the backlighting, the CMB backlighting, gave off three three different colors. Characteristically, suppose it gave off, um, I don't know, seven red photons, uh, four yellow intermediate energy photons, two high energy blue photons. Okay. Um, so you could look at any patch of sky and say, yeah, seven four two. That ratio, that's the cosmic microwave background. So it's not just counting the photons and saying, where does this photon come from? It's like comparing one color population to the other. So what we're saying is, if a packet of photons on this cosmic microwave background passes through one of these clouds of really, 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 really hot gas, some of those red photons are going to turn into blue photons. So instead of 742, you would end up with, I don't know, 643. Or something, right? So you just compare the ratios, and you'd be like, there's more of this than there should be. There's less right. of this than there should I be. I see. So you could have 30, 6, 4, whatevers, you know, hit on some place. But if you had 3,000 hit in another place, you, you would look where the 3,000 went came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could say, oh, wow, there's a lot more blue photons than there should be. So this effect is probably getting washed out by some cloud of gas or something in front of it. So this isn't the only effect that's generating photons, but mm -hmm. when we look specifically at the cosmic microwave background signal, this is an effect that modifies the cosmic microwave background signal. And a lot of the intervening structure between us and the CMB is sort of tiny compared with, you know, the overarching whole sky. So, you know, their impact is relatively small. So the ratio, so like the ratio of those that have been changed is actually pretty small compared to the the type of photon you would normally expect the cmb to just be feeding you all the time yeah most of the cmb signal doesn't pass through these galaxy clusters yeah you need you need a fair amount of, of this hot gas to cause it and then the other thing i was going to mention is what Dana t danica touched on which is that the the whole secret here why this is clever right and why people spend effort doing this is lots of things in in the universe look hot stars galaxies, they all look hot, right? They're all emitting photons. Nothing looks like a hole. So by looking for the hole, you're kind of automatically rejecting a lot of things that aren't the thing you're looking for, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of the secret to success here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's really unique because it's the one 
thing where uh, you're not limited by your ability to capture photons that come from that particular source. So like a star, the further away a star gets, the harder it gets to see. But with this effect, as long as, you know, the cluster of galaxies is big enough, it can be super far away. And it, in, in this effect, it still looks as bright. Right. I see. Yeah, yeah. You know, is there, a, is there a point at which something will get so far that, like, we're never going to see the photons that are being No, that's the it? great thing, because those photons are the CMB photons. So, oh, right. Um, they come to us no matter what, that, the same number of photons. And it's really all just limited by how big that blob of galaxies is in between us and them. So it, it turns out that, you know, as luck would have it, most of these clusters of galaxies live in a certain, at a certain distance between us and the CMB. And so they, on average, tend to be about the same size, which is... They're, they're like uh, arc minutes, so like the size of a small crater on the moon kind of thing. So they all tend to look about the same size, though, right? Yeah, and, 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 and like Danica said, you see them all the way back, except you go so far back eventually that there were no galaxy clusters, and then you kind of run out of gas. You know, even though we talk about the Big Bang, like it, it's hard to not think of the space around us. Um, you know, as a, as a layperson, it's hard to not think of the, the space that surrounds us as it emanates from the Big Bang as just like a sort of ever-increasing cone size. But of course, you know, it's not. But in thinking of it um, four-dimensionally, is there any, I don't know what I would call it other than like an event horizon where the CMB photons like quote-unquote end at this point? Um. So, sort of. It's like you're in the middle of a beach ball, and that beach ball is the wall of CMB photons that left 14 billion years ago and are just hitting you now. And and that and that and the CMB is that is that horizon, right? The the mm-hmm. the horizon you're talking about is defined by the CMB. That's how far a photon came since that epoch, and further back you cannot see, right? Yeah, because the universe was opaque before then because right. it was all made of plasma so photons couldn't travel anywhere before then and what's really cool about the cmb is if you could live forever and you sat and watched it that horizon is moving right so you know in a million years or 10 million years it's going to look different than it does today right because it's still expanding yeah but there is an effect that you might be thinking of called a cosmological horizon where essentially the distance between us and another object far away is increasing right? Because the universe is expanding. And so the farther away an object is, the faster it will be moving relative to us. Um, Eventually, as the universe continues to expand and accelerate its expansion, you know, in billions and billions of years, when you look out uh, and you try to see the CMB, those CMB photons will be of... uh, the, The idea is that they won't be moving fast enough to reach us, given the expansion of the universe. That's, and so the effect is that of an event horizon. Right. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that's... that's, that's I, didn't, I didn't even understand what I was asking, but that is exactly what I was trying to... Yeah, so about. we're not... The universe isn't old enough for us to see that attribute yet. In our current universe, there is a cosmological horizon, at least theoretically, but the news that we're getting from around that area is is too old for us to be able to see it or observe it or interact with it. Right. Is it fair to say that if one were looking to make a visual representation that was not at all scientifically accurate of like one of these CMB photon waves that, you know, when it reaches us, the signature that it carries in understanding where it came from in understanding how it um, has been affected by these uh, bodies and these gases that it's it's potentially passed through uh, is almost like actually reading the wave backwards like as if it had been visually uh printed in space uh yeah that's kind of the idea right so the photon uh, it's it it passed through this cluster of galaxies billions and millions of years ago so what we're reading as the distribution of photons in the cmb is essentially the history of the entire universe and structure formation along that line through history this is not dissimilar to what we discussed last time in the way that, you know, the sound waves uh, operate. You know, you can you can see the paths of these things, but they really only represent that exact moment when it hits your eardrum, in a way, you know. But it tells the story of all the air that it's moved to get. Yes. I like everything <laughs> about that. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, so to summarize, 
The CMB exists. It's backlighting everything. The photons that we're absorbing now have passed through everything in the observable universe on their journey from when they were emitted billions of years ago to when we detect it. And in doing so, we're getting a, a history of structure formation. Some of them pass through galaxies, and those clusters of galaxies, some of them have really, really hot gas around them. And if the gas is really, really, really hot, it will change the light distribution in this cosmic microwave background signal. And we can interpret that change, compare it to the photons around it, and say, hey, look, these particular group of photons pass through a cluster of galaxies. And we can use this as an astronomical device. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so... Um, um, well, what about the actual discovery of the uh, zones? <laughs> Sunyav Zeldovich. Yes, effect. thank you. They were that sort. <laughs> <laughs> they were uh, two Russian fellows, one of whom is still alive but quite old. Um, but he's a real sweetheart uh, if you ever get the chance to meet him. Um, I certainly hope to now. <laughs> <laughs> and Zeldovich passed away a long time ago, but I'm told he was a complete a hole, so I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, they were doing this work in the early 70s, and then claims of measurements stretch back, oh, to the early 80s, I'd say. But it wasn't really generally accepted. Uh, it wasn't till kind of like 95, I'd say, that people were saying, oh, you know, we think we saw this thing in real life. And then I think the the transformation's been pretty profound where like... What is that, 20 years ago? So there was 10 years of, like, searching around in the darkness, which was kind of like when I was an undergrad and, and Danica. And then I'd say for the last 10 years, it's become like a real workhorse. Um, there's a bunch of telescopes that just kind of do this routinely now, which is amazing to me. You know, I was alive and working when it was hard. And uh, that makes me right. feel old. Right. So this effect was predicted in like the 80s. And then they knew, OK, these are the frequencies where we need to go and look. But it turned out that at that point in time, there weren't detectors that could see that light yet really developed well. Um, and so there were, in particular, a couple of telescopes telescopes where the whole design of the telescope was built around trying to see this light at these frequencies that would reveal these structures. So they use bolometer detectors, which we uh, discussed in a different podcast, but they sort of detect all the light and then you put filters in front of them, just like with your camera, to throw out all the photons you don't care about at the frequencies you don't care about. And then you collect the photons that you do care about and make your picture with them. I get it. From the perspective of Earth. Is there an advantage to geographical location? Would it be better if we could encase the entire planet in one big <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so glad surface. you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> so the general rule of thumb is that anywhere there's plants is bad because uh -huh. plants mean there's moisture and at these wavelengths the thing that kills you is actually water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, which drives us to go to crazy places like the top of volcanoes in Hawaii or the deserts in Chile or uh, the South Pole, because the South Pole is mm -hmm. actually very dry. It's the biggest desert right, in the world. Right, right, right. Um, so a lot of the submillimeter type instruments that do this are in weird places. Yeah, you don't think of the South Pole as being dry, do you? But I guess it's all that moisture just freezes out. Yeah, it's frozen. Um, and, then, and this is specifically, we're talking about light, but... What do they read, for example, at Arecibo, which is, I mean, I know it's up high, but is it that dry up there in the so rainforest of Puerto Rico? No, Arecibo looks in the radio wavelengths, long, long wavelengths, which cut through a lot of stuff. But in fact, there's another thing that's going on, which is that if you sort of look in the ring that is in the plane of where our Milky Way galaxy lies, the Milky Way gets in the way. Huh. Ah, of course, right. Wow, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. So it's better if you can look up out of the pancake of the Milky Way or down. So that's the other thing. The, the confluence of dry places and looking a, away from the Milky Way. This just occurred to me. Is our visual light frequency pollution any problem with this? Nope. No. Okay. So you could do this in the middle of a city if there wasn't a million cell phones and radio stations and whatever the hell else. Yeah, Wi-Fi and things. Right? So, so one one story I have is way back in the Stone Ages when I was a kid, I was observing uh, at a telescope that doesn't exist anymore called the Caltech Submillimeter Observatory. There was an instrument called SUSI, which stood for the Semyov Zoldovich Infrared Background Experiment, something like that. Um, and, you know, we were observing with this thing and nine o'clock at night, suddenly there was all kinds of noise 
And we're like, for two minutes. And we're like, what the hell is this? And it kept happening and happening. And then eventually we put two and two together and realized that, you know, Brad was going downstairs at 9 p.m. and microwaving a burrito. <laughs> and the microwave was leaky, right? And we were picking it up on the instrument because it's the same kind of wavelengths. Right. Yeah, that's so funny. that was the end of microwave burritos. <laughs> right. Come on, Brad. <laughs> it's always Brad, man. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I, I think I have a pretty good picture of of how it work. Uh, how how you know broadly is this is the study of it being deployed and like have we have we found anything? Like, so you know? so what is it good for? Why do we care? <laughs> well, okay. So it turns out that if you you know map out where all of these clusters of galaxies are and you sort of count them up, it can tell you about what ingredients went into your pumpkin pie of the universe. So how much dark matter, how much dark energy, how much radiation, how much baryons. And the proportions of those things will impact how many clusters you'll you see in the sky. So if you see a 1,000 in a particular patch versus 10,000, that means something. The more dark energy you have kind of spreading everything out, the fewer clusters you'll see in a given patch of sky. So they act as the buoys on the ocean of darkness. So the deal is that diff- depending on what's around, uh, galaxies will form in different ways at different rates, uh, right? And it's kind of like a computer modeling thing. You say, hey, grad student, you've got this big fancy computer. Throw this much dark matter, throw this much baryonic matter. Uh, see how long and what types of galaxies you get if you do a really long simulation. Um, okay, so then they'll say, well, if we throw this ratio of dark matter to regular matter, we get this distribution of galaxies. And if you do it this way, you get pancake galaxies like this, right? Whatever. The argument is that this data that we're getting using the SZ effect lets us compare, contrast, uh, judge those simulations to say, okay, so we think we know the baryon density. We know we think we know how much dark matter ratio that particular patch of galaxies had. Ah, are you saying that like can run like an infinite number of simulations, get potential things to look at, and if, if you notice something coming back at you, you know, from the actual CMB, you could like literally just sort of consult some simulated models and then say this looks a little bit like this let's explore a little further you know but yeah it's kind of like you know that how america's test kitchen i think did this like cookie study where they were like hey if we put this much flour and this much butter in the cookies or this much sugar at this temperature how, how do the cookies come out and they ended up with a big table of different shape and size of cookie they're mushier if you put more right and then you know essentially this is a photograph of all the cookies in the universe that is the analogy of the night, Ben. I nominate it. <laughs> <laughs> All the cookies in the universe. <laughs> Those galaxies had this ratio. These galaxies formed this way. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you simulate the universe with different inputs. And, well, you, not the whole universe, but you simulate starting at some point, And then you just ask, is what I see consistent with the model? Right. Okay, and let me ask you this. When you're asking that question, are you running what you are observing like in real time against your database of simulations or are you like a human detective having to study the data bank of simulations and assess yourself if they you know match up with something that you're seeing well we have statistical you know mathematical framework for how to judge how well one thing agrees with the other and and the simulation part is not the easy part, but it's the part where it's kind of deterministic, right? Like, you know how to turn the crank and, and sausage comes out the back end of it. The hard part is with real data where real instruments have all kinds of crud in them, like, let's say, microwave ovens that Brad's making a burrito. And you have to figure out <laughs> Fucking what... Brad, man. Yeah, this guy, I'm telling <laughs> you. Uh, yeah. You know, the hard part about real data is you have to figure out, like, okay, there's all kinds of extra junk in here. What is it? Where did it come from? Which parts do I have to throw away? Because they're complete trash, you know, right, right. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, okay, well, let's talk about what other things you can study with this, because it's a great topic, and there's lots of details that come out of this. Okay, so we talked about finding galaxy clusters because they tell you about where mass is in the universe. 
So if your question is, where's mass in the universe and how does that trace the large scale filamentary structure of dark matter? That's a good question. And that's one thing this can do. This can do. So we talked about that a little bit. But another thing you can th- imagine is that clusters themselves are interesting astrophysical objects that can teach you various things about this, that, and the other. So people sort of study clusters, you know, for their own right. So if you imagine that the gas in the galaxy cluster, it has weather, right? It, it has temperature variations. It's hotter here. It's colder here. It has pressure variations because gas is moving from one place to the other. It's sloshing around. So studying that can tell you various things. And so that's a big thrust and something that I've spent some of my career on is, is understanding like, what can understanding like the spectral details of the SE effect tell us about what's happening in galaxy clusters? Where does this hot gas come from? And so on and so forth. And so that's one thing you can use it for. Another thing is this gas emits x-rays. It's hot. So so just like at the doctor's office with the x-ray that goes through you, you have similar wavelength light that can get made by these very hot photons. And basically by comparing the x-ray and the SZ maps you can tease out what must be the distance through the cluster that the photons traveled. And that is a way to understand basically how the universe is expanding because you you map out basically what does that distance do as a function of distance from us. Uh, so that's been another, you know, you asked earlier, like, what is it good for? What have we learned? So, you know, we've learned about cosmology with a capital C, or some people call it cosmography, which means like, there's a few fundamental numbers that describe the universe. What are they and how big are they? That kind of thing. There's sort of weather and galaxy clusters. There's the cosmic distance ladder, which is, you know, how how far apart are things and how far are we from them, which is you know, a fundamental interest. It calibrates a bunch of things we, we do. So wait, wait, hold on, hold on. When you said that last one, mm-hmm. are you saying that, okay, so the gas is a certain temperature. Mm-hmm. We know because it's doing the SZ effect, we know what temperature this gas is. And so we also know that this gas at this location should be emitting X-rays. Okay. And then we absorb the X-rays and see how much they've redshifted. Is that what you're telling me? So it's actually the other way around, which is you know that it emits X-rays because you go out and observe and X-rays are being emitted. You go out and you measure SZ and there it is. It's the same thing. But basically the X-rays go as the density of the gas squared, whereas SZ goes as just the density of the gas. So by computing their ratio and taking the square root and things like that, you can basically work out what must be the line of sight through the cluster. So it's a kind of measuring two different brightnesses and then taking their ratio kind of argument. But how do we use that to t- determine the redshift profile of the universe? I thought you said... So basically the free parameter when you take that ratio is the Hubble constant, which the Hubble constant is is how fast the galaxies recede away from us as a function of how far they are away from us. Okay, so what you're saying is the density of the gas determines how much SZ effect there is. Mm -hmm. And then in a different way, it determines how much X-rays get emitted. Right. And then the difference between the two also depends on how fast it's moving away from us. And so we can compare the two signals, the SZ effect and the... uh, So how many photons get switched around uh, as as the cosmic microwave background... Uh, photons travel through the gas and compare that to the profile of of the x-rays and in doing so we can learn information about how fast the the galaxy is moving away from us how fast the universe is expanding bingo that's interesting because it sounds like on paper that's that becomes a pretty not complicated equation um, to determine each of those variables that you're that you're talking about in there. Yeah, Mike. Well, I've 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 suppressed a lot of information there, Ted. Right? No, no, well, I, no, I, no I, mean, I mean, like, what you ultimately, you know, the ultimate, you know, variable that you end up with is not going to be more than a, you know, if, I'm not talking about what goes into actually figuring out each of those elements, but like, you're really only talking about sort of these three things that interact and give you a vast wealth of information. Right, yeah, right. Uh, well, I mean, we should do a show someday, Ben, ab- about the difference between reality and mathematical models. That sounds boring. <laughs> I vote no. Oh, okay. Well, so uh, when you write down an equation, 
that describes a physical system. So that equation has, I don't know, 10 different variables in it. Some of them are fixed, like the value of pi. Some of them you are safe assuming or just at least saying, I'm going to basically claim ignorance on that and just assume it's a two. And then you get numbers that you get to basically fit as part of the model. You get to constrain from the data. And you're absolutely right. So H is ultimately the thing that gets constrained. But the way people do it, there's a couple other things that get constrained at the same time. And it's kind of mushy. To get get H is a whole To get H. You got it. (laughs) Right. You got it. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so those are those are let's see three things we got up to. Uh, another one is we talked about dark matter. It's what makes up galaxy clusters at some level. How do you make a galaxy cluster? Well, you take a little galaxy clusters and you bang them together and you get a big one. Or you take a big one and you add a little one. So people go out and they make measurements of dark matter as it's passing. Uh, well, no, you can't see dark matter. That's the first statement. <laughs> <laughs> dark matter has no signature whatsoever. Only indirect. Okay, so picture it like this. Uh, Dark matter has a bunch of fans that are baryonic matter that is like you and me, stuff that interacts with photons. And so dark matter, you know, is going out to clubs and stuff, and it's got this baryonic matter, just can't shake, right? And so let's say it wants to go to the cluster party. It'll, you know, gravitationally attract, and it'll go into the bigger cluster, and that baryonic matter is just going right along with it until the baryonic matter hits the atmosphere, basically, of this galaxy cluster, at which point the dark matter is still going to go at the same speed, right? It's not interacting with anything. It's just going to go straight through at the other side and then come on back because it it's just going purely through gravity. There's no pressure. But the baryonic matter, first of all, was following it, but then it sees that atmosphere and it goes, oh, crap, I'm going way too fast. And it has to kind of break. Basically, think of it as a shock. There's actually pictures of shocks of matter going through cluster atmospheres that look like a bullet, basically. It looks like a shock front. And you can do the calculation. You can basically say, well, you need dark matter to make this baryonic matter go that fast because the baryonic matter on its own doesn't have enough mass to be that attracted to this bigger cluster. So it must be that there's some slug of dark matter that this thing was following and then it hit the atmosphere splat and it makes the shock and we can go and measure that. And it ends up that measuring with the SE effect is, is a good way to do that. It's, it's kind of a hard measurement, but people are doing it nowadays. Uh, d- dark matter has mass? Yes. Okay. You, so you know what it is sort of before it hits, and that's how you can determine that it, that it is the, the only thing that passed through. You, you see how fast the baronic matter is, is going and how much there is, and then you back out how much of mass there must have Got been. Got it. Okay. That's, yeah. And then the final thing that I could think of was there's this funny thing called the kinetic sunyev zeldovich effect. Now we're really getting down the rabbit hole. The sunyev zeldovich effect we've been talking about so far is I haven't talked about things moving with respect to each other. It's just photons hitting electrons and bouncing off kind of thing. Here you can imagine that the galaxy cluster is moving with respect to the cosmic microwave background. So that means that photons coming from one direction have more energy than photons coming from the opposite direction, just from Doppler shifting. Right. Okay. And so what that means to us is when we look at these clusters, we see a little bit of a signal having to do with the fact that the cluster itself is moving along the line of sight in some way. And basically that lets you measure not only the position of the cluster, but also how fast it's moving. And if you know both of those things, you can constrain these cosmological models we were talking about earlier in a way that is kind of new information. Like you're not measuring the same thing. It's like going to let you measure some other parameters really well. So that's something that is just, just coming online now. Is that better for measuring the size of something? Like the sort of overall dimensions of something? Okay, so what he's saying is, you take a picture of the universe, you know where all the galaxies are, hooray. You don't know necessarily, just based on that, which direction each galaxy is going. Is one moving away from the pack? Are they all collapsing towards the middle? What's going on, right? Because it's just a moment in time, we're just getting a snapshot of where they are. So Mike's saying that because if it's moving quickly relative to this cosmic microwave background, we can detect a signal that tells us which direction and how fast the the piece of the galaxy, that clump of gas, is moving relative to, uh, well, us. And so we can get a picture. We can say, here is not just where the galaxies rest, but 
which direction they're going, how fast they're all heading, and that can inform our uh, models for how these galaxies form dynamically. I think I get that. <laughs> or, okay, okay, let me, I, I just thought of an analogy, and maybe it's terrible, but I'll try it. Okay, so I have a pool, and I have a bunch of balls, <laughs> and I chuck the balls in the pool, and then I take a photo. The photo tells me where the balls are now, and by knowing where the balls are now and maybe some simple assumptions how they were arranged when I chucked them in, I could back out what what the initial conditions are and also where they're going to go. But that's really uncertain, right? You don't really know where they're going to go. So if I can measure not only where they are, but where their velocity is headed, I can actually figure out where they came from and where they're going. So it's basically that. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the future? Like, what, like, what are, what are you hoping for? Like, what are people looking for? You know, what are people looking for? Uh, so the KSZ effect that I was just talking about is a big deal. Um, and I'm interested myself, for example, in, uh, learning about very hot gas and galaxy clusters. So it ends up, this is another complication, but ends up the SZ effect has this shape, but the shape depends on the temperature of the gas. In a very high temperatures, you get weird, special relativistic Einstein kind of stuff happening. And we're at this point now where we can actually start probing that and using it to kind of understand the dynamics of plasmas at very high energy, much higher energy than we can achieve in the lab at home. So that's another future direction. And I, I think people are going to still use it for cosmology, although it's things have kind of moved on from that, I'd say. Oh, and here's a cool one is actually you can measure the temperature of the uh, cosmic microwave background as a function of distance. So everybody assumes, oh, well, the temperature just varies, you know, smoothly with the distance away. So as you go back, it goes back as some, you know, simple function. Um, that doesn't, it doesn't have to be. And if it didn't, you'd go, oh my God, something's really wrong with our understanding of how the universe works. So people look for that as well. To summarize, when we talk about how the universe has evolved as a picture. Various questions come up, right? You can talk about what the universe is made of, how it evolved, how, how galaxies formed, at, at what scale is the universe expanding, uh, how that profile depends on position, how that's changed over time. And the information that we're getting from this technique provides a lot of good details that we can use to understand our, our models and which picture is right overall. I dig it. I like it. I'm very interested. I'm going to read more. <laughs> okay. Well, that was fun. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Danica. You've pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Here's some fruit. Mike, you get a persimmon. <laughs> oh, nice. And Danica, you get a tangerine. <laughs> That's Gross. good. Yeah. Very, you peeled that very quickly, too. <laughs> <laughs> it was very ripe. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank my guest, Ted Leo. Thank you, Ted. That was lots of fun. Thank you. It was really fun. All right. Well, it's announcement time. That was a super fun episode. First, first announcement, please give us an iTunes review or tell other people about us online. Why? Because people keep their deep love of physics and astronomy secret. They want to know that there's a show like ours online for them to listen to, but they don't know we exist. So a subset of your friends and family will be really, really happy for you to tell them about us. And then you'll have someone to talk with about all the physics you learned. All right. On another note, we are still humbly soliciting your donations. Your donations go to paying our server fees and our project to transcribe the episode as they come out. And a new project where we buy everybody fancy new microphones. Did you hear how good Mike sounded this episode? That's right. That's because we bought him a microphone with your donations. All right. So if you want to donate some money, you can send one-time donations through PayPal off of our website, or you can go to our sweet Patreon site and give a recurring oh, $2 donation. This particular episode of the Titanium Physicist Podcast has been sponsored by a collection of generous people. I'd like to thank the generosity of Jordan Young for his donation. And then I'd also like to thank Sixton Linuson, Lawrence Lee, Mr. Simon, Keegan Ede, Adrian Schoening, Andreas from Knoxville, Cadby, Joe Campbell, Alexandra Zani is great, Winna Brett, Eric Deutsch. Etienne, a gentleman named Peter Fan, 
Gareth Eason, Joe Piston, David Johnson, and Anthony Leon, as well as Doug B., Julia, Noah Robertson, Ian and Stu, a Mr. Frank, Philip from Austria, and Noisy Mime, Mr. Shlomo Delal, Melissa Burke, Yasin Uarzazi, Spider Rogue, Insanity Orbits, Robert Johnson, Madame Sandra Johnson, a Mr. Jacob Wick, Mr. John Keyes, a Mr. Victor C., Ryan Kloss, Peter Clipsham, Mr. Robert Halpin, Elizabeth Teresa, and Paul Carr, a Mr. Ryan Newell, Mr. Adam K., Thomas Shai Ray, a Mr. Jacob S., a gentleman named Brett Evans, a lady named Jill, a gentleman named Greg, thanks Steve, Mr. James Clausen, Mr. Devin North, a gentleman named Scott, Ed Lowlington, Kelly Wienersmith, Jocelyn Reed, and Mr. S. Hatcher, Mr. Rob Abrazado, and Mr. Robert Stietka. Okay. That's it for the Titanium Physicist Podcast this time. Remember that if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, there are lots of other lovely science shows on the Bracula Media Network. The intro song is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists. Oh yeah, that was today's guest. And the end song is by John Vanderslice. Good day, my friends, and until next time, remember to keep science in your hearts. to tell you dear before you come back here I lost I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage he was eating spring mix on the carpet jumped through a window out into the haze hop down magnolia boulevard no When was the cosmic microwave background identified as such? Uh, what was it, 65? It was okay. Penzias and Wilson, and they won a Nobel Prize for it, so it's kind of a big what? deal. That's when it was first observed, and um, what's sort of funny is that it was either the CMB that they were seeing, which had been predicted, or it was pigeon poop on, on their antenna. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Those were the options. <laughs> The story was like they were working for Bell Labs and they had a great big microwave antenna telescope, right? So it was a horn that was pointed in a certain, certain direction. And I think they were trying to tune it. So they were trying to, you know, make sure that no strange signals were, were coming from it. They were trying to prep the instrument to do, I don't know. Echo balloon satellites. Oh, echo uh, balloon satellite. Okay. Who knows what so that is? Should, I don't know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, and then, so when they turned it on and had it listening, you know, there's like, oh, well, there's this buzz. And they figured out where that buzz was coming from. Maybe the screw was loose or, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, and then they were like, man, there's a buzz that we can't get rid of. In this. Okay. There's a signal coming in that we can't get rid of. And so they went up and they said, oh, it's all this pigeon poop in the in the horn <laughs> and so they cleaned it out and right. then the, the the signal stayed and it was the the first detection of the cosmic right. microwave background okay so, that, so when, i feel like that's kind of a famous like that that uh you know me without knowing the details of the year and the the, the people that's sort of a, a famous story and the snow that we hear or see on our various antennas on the radio or whatever is is uh, related to this yeah, so there's some statistic that you and I are probably old enough to remember old antenna TVs. Yes. Um, you know, you used to tune it between channels and there was like snow. Yes. That, that, that like one in 400 of those or one in 100, something like that, of those uh, noisy things was because right. of a CMB photon. Interesting. Okay. Wow. I, I feel like the sort of, uh, you know, popular lore on that is that that's all CMB. Oh, yeah. No, that's, yeah. no. You tune between, sta- tune between stations and you're hearing the Big Bang, man. You know? <laughs> like that, yeah. I feel like that was the line I, I got, you know, growing up. But it's good to – now I know. Well, I, 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 know. I, still, I still am blown away. Like, CMB photons interact with your body once in a while, too. And, like, I'm still blown away that this poor photon just propagated itself 
14 billion years, you know, across the universe and it ended up hitting my TV or something. Right, like, right, right. Depends how, on what you're watching. But, you know. Yeah, right, right. I mean, you, you, I mean, all right, I'm probably going to delete my saying this, but like some of them hit like dog poop, right? Right. Sure. At least it hit your TV antenna. Yeah. <laughs> could be worse. <laughs> there are worse places it could be. Yeah. I have worse. one more question based on where we've gotten to so far. And as you guys were describing the you know reverse uh, action of the Big Bang and objects that we think of as relatively solid, you know, in space, be that planet, star, galaxy, expanding into into gas as we go in reverse, uh, while the larger picture is actually collapsing into mm-hmm. a, into a near you know singularity so like so in the big bang we have you have mass expansion but localized congealing and compacting into the the bodies in space that that we know is that correct that's correct yep i mean that's the general at the large scale the universe is getting bigger right but at the smaller scale things are collapsing uh, you know, matter's collapsing into galaxies. The dust and stuff in galaxies is collapsing into stars and planets. And is that just because things cool and attraction increases? Is you're, like what's you know? I think the answer is because it's getting cooler. Uh, you know, there was a time when it was. You can you can think about the energy density mm-hmm. of the universe is decreasing, mm-hmm. um, and then you can also think of structures as only being able to form once uh, once the system is cool enough. Right? right, so there's a time when it's so hot that electrons have too much energy to stick to protons. Right, and then once the, once the universe is cooled past that point, they'll stick together. Uh, and similarly, dust won't collapse down into a point unless it's uh, moving slowly enough. That and that happens as the as the universe kind of stretches out all the energy. The energy from the initial bang decreases as gravity eventually draws, slowing and cooling things toward each other because it, that that attraction becomes more powerful than what is actually the overall expansion. So the overall expansion gets larger, the larger a volume you have, but um, things will collapse down into smaller structures uh, at, a, at a, depending on how big those structures are locally. Uh, I don't know how to say that right. No, no, that, yeah, <laughs> I, I get it. Okay. 